Here are the St. Catherine docks. They lie just outside the old city walls, and they advertise themselves as Central London's only marina. But the history goes back a long, long way. Let's have a look into it, shall we? Now, you'll sometimes hear them referred to as St. Catherine's Dock. This is incorrect. It's St. Catherine Docks. There are two of them. And only one St. Catherine, I guess. The St. Catherine, from whom they take their name, is St. Catherine's by the Tower, a 12th century church and hospital founded by Queen Matilda. I wonder if this is why people sometimes get confused by the name. The docks are St. Catherine, but the parish is St. Catherine's. The church survived the dissolution of the monasteries due to being under the custodianship of the Queen Mother. However, it could not survive the Industrial Revolution. Since the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, by law, all ships had to be unloaded between London Bridge and the Tower, at what were known as the Legal Keys. By the late 18th century, when the Industrial Revolution was getting into full swing, the arrangement was proving to be wholly inadequate. It could take weeks for ships to be unloaded, during which time perishable goods could spoil and pirates could take advantage of the immobilised vessels. In 1799, the West India Dock Act was passed, enabling the West India Dock to be constructed outside of the city. This initially created a monopoly for the owners of the East and West India Docks, but when that expired in 1820, the floodgates were opened, so to speak, for the construction of other docks. Just to dash back in time again quickly, the 1621 play The Witch of Edmonton includes a reference to a Catherine's Dock in the form of a dirty joke about a character named Catherine. This refers to a small dock built to serve the hospital. Another dock was built here in 1663. This was what they called a sufferance wharf, which was an official subsidiary to the legal keys, created in a desperate attempt to relieve congestion. Too small to have any real effect. To make way for the new set of docks, the ancient church would have to go. In 1825, it was knocked down against a background of much local opposition. The argument in favour of demolition was that this was a slum area, and clearing the old buildings was surely for the greater good, because that's just how people thought in the 19th century. The docks were designed by the famous engineer Thomas Telford, and were drawn up with maximum speed and efficiency in mind. They consisted of two basins, east and west, the warehouses were placed directly on the quayside so that ships could be unloaded directly by hoist with minimal handling. Carts, taking the goods inland, were to come up on the landward side of the warehouses so that they could be loaded up without interfering with incoming cargo. The warehouses were built on cast iron columns for maximum strength under pressure, essential for the weight of the cargo they were to hold and indeed the weight of the enormous warehouses themselves. The frames were timber, iron frames would have been preferable, but expensive. Steam-powered pumping engines and gates were installed to ensure that ships wouldn't be subject to the tide while they were in dock. Crossings were provided in the form of lifting and retractable bridges. Technologically speaking, it was state-of-the-art. At least in theory. The docks took three years to build from authorisation to opening, and Telford complained very strongly about being rushed, both due to the engineering challenges and the risks to workers. This guy was president of the Institute of Civil Engineers. They named a town after him in Shropshire. He knew what he was talking about. In fact, at one point during construction, the temporary dam failed and flooded the works, underlining his point about risks. Nevertheless, despite Telford's objections, the docks were open for business in 1828. They weren't as big as the East and West India docks further down river, but they had the advantage of location. They were that much closer to the city. Therefore, they were initially much in favour. Ships came from all over the world. Exotic cargoes like ostrich feathers, ivory, wine, spices, rum, tortoise shell, carpets and mother of pearl were unloaded here as well as less exciting goods like guano, tallow and wool. The most important cargo was tea. Now you might think the British like their tea today, but back then it was the foundation of empire. In a very real sense. The tax on tea paid for the upkeep of the British Empire. 120,000 tea chests were unloaded at St Catherine's every year. Despite all this, St Catherine's quickly began to suffer a slump. The docks 
made the bulk of their money not from shipping, but from storage. The government introduced what was known as the Free Water Clause, which let lightermen come into the docks and take cargo straight from the ships to other facilities upriver. No need for long-term storage in warehouses. This cut severely into the profits of all the docks, but St. Catharines, being relatively small and very close to those upriver facilities, was hit hard. Being so close to the city, it had cost a lot to build, and the company were rather hoping to make more of their money back. The huge warehouses, now half empty, became a liability. The coming of the railways meant that they lost much of their location advantage on top of all that. The docks were forced to cut their rates. But St. Catharines weren't the only ones to suffer. Competition between the docks proved ruinous and forced a number of amalgamations. In 1864, St. Catharines and their rival, the London Docks, were forced to amalgamate with the Victoria Dock Company. In 1909, all the docks were brought together under the Port of London Authority, whose headquarters were very near to St. Cath's. The Second World War brought a new threat to London's docks in the form of air raids. The warehouses of the East Basin were destroyed by bombing. As the basin was unusable, it became a temporary landfill site for rubble created elsewhere. In the 1950s, it was discovered that the gates were leaking, a hangover from the rush job that Thomas Telford had complained about 130 years previously. So in 1957, a rebuilding programme was undertaken. But, alas, in vain. St. Catharines just couldn't handle modern shipping, which was only getting bigger and bigger. In 1862, the Rochdale report into the docks advised closing them altogether. In 1968, the closure became official. The docks were sold to the Greater London Council, who began a programme of finishing what the Luftwaffe had started. The surviving original Telford warehouses were knocked down between 1970 and 80. The Tower Hotel stands on the site of Warehouse A. Warehouse G was rebuilt into the Dickens Inn. Actually, the North East London Polytechnic survey doesn't say rebuilt, it says mutilated. I mean, people say the Tower Hotel is brutalist, but it sounds like those guys were brutalist of all. In the 1980s, the docks housed a historic ship collection, including Ernest Shackleton's polar exploration vessel Discovery. However, as redevelopment was still going on, it wasn't an attractive location for visitors, and the collection was dispersed. These days, the docks are described as a mixed-use district, which, as regular viewers will know, is a term I revile. They do house some important historic vessels. Winston Churchill's funeral boat, the Haven Gore, is moored here, as is the Royal Barge Gloriana, and singer Edith Piaf's yacht, the Flamand Rose. I have a lot of trouble with that French R. Rose. 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 When it was moored in Paris, the yacht was where P.F. entertained... Is entertained the word I'm looking for? Where she entertained the boxer, Marcel Sardin, during their brief but intense fling. Insert joke about rocking the boat here. Several of the Dunkirk little ships can be seen here from time to time, although I didn't see any when I went to film this. They are also, as I mentioned at the start, a marina where many glamorous boats are moored. The Docklands are popular with those selling yachts due to their proximity to city airport and the fact that there's a lot of water that no one's really using. For all I've not been too complimentary about what's happened to the docks since their closure, I should note that they are a pleasant place to visit, and they offer a haven from the bustle of the city. Don't let me put you off. I do think it's well worth the trip. Well, I hope that, like Edith Piaf, you had no regrets about watching this video. If so, please do click the like button and perhaps subscribe for more content. I found researching this video really interesting, and I'm thinking I might actually do more videos about the history of the individual docks, if that is a thing that people would like to see. Let me know in the comments. Thanks, as always, to my generous donors on Ko-fi and Patreon. You are the tea to my empire. And I'll see you all again very soon. Cheerio!